Welcome to the Loins of History podcast, a podcast about connecting history to today. My name is Jay. I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. And this week, we are continuing our series on a history of capitalism and socialism in America. And over the last couple of weeks, we've kind of seen this thread of increasing uh, labor union involvement in the uh, in the economy and as well as growing big business. So uh, we talked about Rockefeller and Standard Oil and Andrew Carnegie last week. So Colin, how do we see these two interests kind of colliding in the late 1800s and early 1900s? I think colliding is the best way to put it because um, these two movements had been growing and gaining strength since the end of the Civil War. And just to set the stage, so we have to remember that from a tycoon big business perspective, the amount of production in the US, it's unbelievable how much more we were able to produce and the wealth it created. Just a, a couple numbers to run by you about the, the pr- increase in production. If you think about it, before the Industrial Revolution, it would take about 60 hours to work an acre in the field. Now it was about uh, three hours. You know, it would take, we were producing tens of millions more barrels of oil per month than we were before. You know, it take a bu- to get a bushel of wheat, it took three hours. Now it took 15 minutes. So this unbelievable level of production and wealth became, you know, just how the American economy worked. So we were no longer an agrarian society working for our livelihood and we grew the food we ate. We had this consumer class now, this consumer class, a labor class and a very ultra wealthy class. And I think that's important to recognize because then on the flip side of it, so there, there's this great, we have all this new invention and new innovation, thousands of miles of tra- of railroad tracks and oil pipelines and things were cheaper. Generally speaking, things were a lot cheaper. But on the other side, you had the labor movement, which we discussed where you had a rapid urbanization and people living in what we would consider slums working for low wages and long hours. And it was often very dangerous and dirty work. And then in the rural areas where there are still farms, primarily in the South and Midwest, you had these popu- this populist movement gaining speed because um, these machines were great, but they couldn't afford them. Eventually, their loans were called in because they couldn't pay for these machines. So you had this massive amount of unrest amongst these quote unquote, lower classes, these labor classes. And we started seeing that in riots. We started talking more and more about the riots that happened and these strikes. And it's not like now where, you know, we there's the Amtrak strike just recently where, oh, okay, right. well, we're all going to get on social media. We're going to, we're just not going to show up to work. Strikes were very violent then. Um, it is not right. uncommon for people to be beaten and people to die. We talked, you know, we posted about the Ludlow massacre. There's the Haymarket incident. There's a ton of them. Yeah. The picket, we talk about uh, picket lines yeah. as just now it just means like, oh, I'm going to stand in front of there with the sign. Back then it meant I'm going to forcibly prevent the new employees, the strike breakers that this company hired from getting into the factory. <laughs> in 1892, um, Andrew, one of Andrew Carnegie's steel mills, uh, the workers went on strike, just as an example. They went on strike. You talk about a picket line. He actually built a fence with razor or barbed wire at the time, barbed wire on top of the fence. So, And it actually had um, rifle hole or ports that you could put a rifle through to oh, shoot, shoot people. Yeah. Oh, shoot. <laughs> literally. Yeah. So <laughs> quite literally to shoot people. And they would hire private security, the Pinkertons, to come in and protect strike breakers because they would be beaten on their way to work. Yeah. So it, it, and there was this sense amongst this class and even the, the wealthy felt it as well of this just unrest and general unease and this violence is going to spill over. And the only reason it's really not is because this hasn't gained a lot of mainstream attention. It's really between this low labor class and this very ultra wealthy class. And there's the strife and this huge middle consumer class based on my research, I think was kind of left alone or they didn't really, they were kind of apathetic to it. Um, A lot of them were tight, you know, it didn't affect them. They were actually, as we stated, they kind of had a negative view of the strikers, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of like get back to work. 
Um, yeah. But that was until Ida Tarbell published the history of the Standard Oil Company and Teddy Roosevelt came along and channeled the outrage that followed to break up these trusts because a lot of it was exposed. I think in order to understand this, I want to go back a little bit to explain Ida Tarbell and I think some of her motivations and how she came to write the history of the Standard Oil because it's really an incredible story. So Ida Tarbell was born in Western Pennsylvania in the oil field, you know, the oil field in area of uh, Pennsylvania, actually near a, a city called Titusville, where John Rockefeller and some of his associates bought some of the uh, oil refineries in that area. Fast forward a few years, if you remember, we spoke about um, this collusion with the railroads and what was called the South Improvement Plan, where um, John Rockefeller would get massive amounts of rebates. Um, and this is all very hush hush. And it was designed that he would get an unfair advantage over some of the other more local oil refineries that were owned by smaller firms. Uh, Ida Tarbell's father was affected by this, and in her area, she, you know, she talks about in some of her biographies how this really unsettled the community and it caused a lot of turmoil because people were put out of work and were taken over. They were basically faced with a choice that how do we compete with this guy? And then came mm. the Cleveland Massacre, which John Rockefeller basically came in, threatened, and in the matter of a few months, bought um, 22 of 26 oil refineries in that area, um, mm. essentially at cost and or less than that, and pennies on the dollar in, in a lot of cases. Mm. And he presented it as either you buy or you you take the buyout and your family and i think he was quoted as saying and your family will never know want again which a lot of them took it hmm. and they were very wealthy or i will destroy you and buy it for pennies on the dollar and most of hmm. the oil ref you know the the owners of the oil refineries felt like they didn't have a choice so they took the buyout or they tried to fight him and ida tarbell's father was one of the ones who tried to stand against him and hmm. even though they had you know since her father had gotten in the oil business had become somewhat wealthy. After this, they were almost ruined. He had to mortgage the house just to make ends meet, to pay bills, just absolutely devastated him. And I think, and I like to think that Ida, this was a, a transformative moment for Ida where she no longer viewed the progress of these monopolies and these growing, um, yeah, these growing monopolies and tycoons as a good thing for the country because it was done through an unjust, what she deemed as an unjust means because her father and her community was negatively affected for the most part. That happened in the early 1870s. Over the next couple decades, you know, the political scene, as we talked about, was one of essentially apathy. The Republicans generally dominated the elections at the national level, and they were very, quote, business friendly. Um, and we talked about the spoils and patronage system. Uh, most of them were essentially, I would say, on the payroll of a lot of these big business tycoons. There's all sorts of quotes of tycoons basically saying they don't care who wins the election because they've hmm. got people in either party. They're not mm. going to be affected. They're not going to be touched. There were what I would call toothless attempts by politicians to curb the growing influence and power of these tycoons who were essentially becoming oligarchs um, in their hmm. own right and viewed themselves almost above government. And that's important. That's an important distinction. A lot of the fear became that these oil uh, not oil tycoons, but these oligarchs became more powerful than the government. It was no longer equal or the government who was had a mandate from the people more powerful in calling the shots. So some of these toothless, you know, the there's the, the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 formed the ICC, and this was designed to regulate railroads. But in reality, what it did was essentially allow Carnegie and some of these and the, some of these others involved in the railroad basically to squash their own competition with it. So they just bypassed mm. it. They paid off people uh, in order not to investigate their um, their business practices, and they would sell stock to congressmen in order to look the other way at very low prices hmm. to avoid anyone taking notice. And then they would make a, a bunch of money off of it. That sounds and oddly it, familiar. <laughs> it, oddly familiar, exactly. <laughs> History rhymes, and if you hmm. if you don't remember, go back to the uh, the money and politics. So the money and politics, obviously, at this era was a lot dirtier and just more blatant. But there are ways yeah. that money gets funneled from big business to politicians through in the form of five hundred one c fours and super PACs. Is it corruption if it's legal? Exactly. Hmm. It, we're the least corrupt country in the world because everything's le we find legal loopholes. <laughs> And we laugh, anyway. but 
We digress. Uh, we digress. <laughs> it's a good digress. The Sherman Antitrust Act was another act that was championed and put forth by a senator from Ohio named John Sherman, which in theory is great because it allows the Department of Justice, basically it's designed to create or prevent monopolies from forming and then allows the Department of Justice to go out and investigate and break them up if they're found in violation. Great in theory, but Ultimately, during the 1890s, the Supreme Court actually sided with big business more often than not. And ironically, they used the 14th Amendment um, hmm. Hmm, on business and even tried to declare personhood to some of these business entities and machines. I, I was I, When I was read my, the, did the research, and I think um, if you've ever read um, Howard Zinn's People's History of Amer the United States, you know, the 14th Amendment obviously – for them is attributed to slavery, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. But in the 1890s and early 1900s, I think it was somewhere around 280 plus uh, Supreme Court decisions were made by um, for big business and only 14 for after African-Americans. So huh. we can see it was really used um, for not, you know, the rights that of African-Americans, but big business. Yeah. So, and that goes to the spoils and patronage and the cor general corruption and that was occurring right now during this time. The like I said, the 1890s were very corrupt. Big business flourished. Then President McKinley was assassinated, and we discussed that he was assassinated by an anarchist who did it for the good of the working man, the good people, Holy the on. working man, exact the working man. And Teddy Roosevelt became president. Huge shift in U.S. politics. So I'm going to go back to Ida Tar Tarbell. So Ida Tarbell during this time was working for a magazine called McClure's Magazine at the time. And she was an investigative journalist. So again, fascinating woman of history. She was kind of ahead, actually really ahead of her time. The fact that she was an investigative journalism, A, working, B, an investigative journalist mm -hmm. working for a major magazine, it was very well educated. She did a lot of works on crime and femi you know, feminism and women's suffrage. And now she had the opportunity with McClure's Magazine to go after these trusts because as we just said, you can see the corruption was just everywhere and it was public or it was her public enemy, number one. So she yeah, wanted to go it was after personal. It was personal, very personal. So she had to make a decision on which trust because there's a lot of them. There's steel, there's sugar, there was railroads, there was oil, the list goes on. She had to decide which one and make it. I like to think that she remembered back to her father when she was growing up and say, I know exactly the trust I'm going to go after. And it was a, per I like to think it was a vendetta, which it just makes for a better story. <laughs> <laughs> so Ida Tarbell spends years investigating Standard Oil, years. And she interviewed a lot of um, executives who were very powerful. And it's funny because when she interviewed some of these executives, like they kind of had no idea that, like, I, I don't think they, an investigative journalist quite had the negative connotation because there's some writings that they actually thought she was going to write Standard Oil in a positive light. So they were like, yeah, you can come in. This is exactly mm. what we do. Um, and it just, that's not how it worked. And so one of the executives was Henry H. Rogers. And he just opened everything up and told her about everything they did. Because again, we go back to this before in their minds, they were doing a good thing. The wealth that they created in some of their practices mm -hmm. was not bad because the ends yeah. justified the means. Hey, we're giving people low, low cost oil. We're building all these pipelines. It doesn't matter if we're bribing people. It doesn't matter yep. if we are committing corporate destroying espionage, small business, destroying yeah. <laughs> small business, preventing people from owning private property. So, so she, with Henry H. Rogers, he was one of the executives that really just divulged too much. There was another incident where um, a boy who worked for Standard Oil, his job was literally to burn documents, <laughs> just put documents oh, wow. in the fire and burn them. Well, he'd happened to notice that he saw the name of a man he went to church with. And so, he kept all of them. Because he thought, hmm. oh, I'm supposed to keep these. I know this man. He ended up giving those to um, Ida Tarbell. And hmm. what it turned out to be was proof of corporate espionage where he was – these documents were bribes going through and finding out what prices other companies were paying so they could use this information and undercut all these other companies and gain an unfair advantage. Yeah. And Yo, then this would make a great movie. It, it really, it would make a great movie because she spent years doing this. This is not like, Hey, I spent a week on the internet and I just wrote a cool blog about it or I did a podcast. 
<laughs> she literally and and that was another thing. There were not as many means of communication. So when she published this, it was to a wide uh to a large audience. So mm-hmm. and another thing about the the history of Standard Oil, when she wrote it, um she and I you know, this is how I think that she was very brilliant because she was able to to sift through the complex nature of these trusts and communicate it in a way that your average reader would understand. I think we talked about this before with the average laborer. They're not sitting around and studying these massive trusts. They didn't owe general business accounting practices. They didn't know all that. And Ida Tarbell recognized that and said, I've got to find a way to communicate this. And it's not just some philosophical mumbo jumbo. It's not overly complicated where nobody is interested in reading it. She broke through and wrote it in a way that everyone could understand. So it had a massive impact, which Mm. is in and of itself a feat because A, you had to, to basically map out these companies, which were designed designed to be inherently complex. So when these trusts were made together, it was, you know, the Standard Oil Trust could be composed of, it was upwards of 30 different smaller companies. And a lot of the legal means that they used and how money flowed was designed to be complicated. So if there ever was an investigation, nobody could follow the money. They also owned shares in all of these other companies and they may be a minority stockholder, but they still had a large voice in timber and coal and steel and the railroads. So when John Rockefeller did something, everyone took notice. And you think about it, it doesn't have to be that large in order to make an impact. Think about Elon Musk with Twitter. I think he only bought 9 to 11% of the company. Yep. And he was the largest and then the second largest shareholder. And people freaked out. It triggered a buyout. So, yeah. if you think if John Rockefeller, who his wealth was – his personal wealth was estimated around $200 million at the time, which would be – 400 billion in today's dollars. So if you think Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are wealthy, we, it, that's almost impossible to, that's probably lowballing his wealth. He hmm. could, he made, um, he was able through this complex system to leverage his money and really influence everyone around him. Ida hmm. Tarbell communicated that in the history of the Standard Oil Company to people in McClure's magazine. Initially, it was serialized across like 19, um, editorial, I guess, publications. And then eventually in 1905, it was combined into a book. The public was furious. So like I mentioned before, this consumer class, this, as we call them now, the middle class was pretty indifferent. I'd like to think to, um, to these large trusts because they were getting cheaper oil. They were doing great things. And honestly, a lot of them got better wages. They were working, you know, women were in the workforce. I think at this point, there's about half a million women in the workforce. They comprised a large portion of labor unions. Um, they were getting and people that were not necessarily in the factories were enjoying the benefits and they got better wages and they felt okay. But they read this and they saw that these were just unfair business practice. And they figured they decided that the ends did not justify the means because it's not that John Rockefeller was necessarily delivering low cost oil. He was doing it by destroying everyone else around him. And they mm. felt like that was unjust. And that's kind of where we that's the context that we start getting yeah. Uh, that the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 is like the Congress is feeling a growing political dissent against big business. However, the econ- you know the American economic theory at the time uh, was not bought into socialism hook line and sinker. However, it did understand that monopolies have an anti-competitive effect. So, uh, the the whole point of the Sherman Antitrust Act is to introduce competition in the marketplace. So, and even today, fast forward, you know, a hundred plus some odd years later. One one economic school of th- or a conglomeration of several economic schools of thought in contradiction to socialist economic schools of thought holds that competition should be uh, the uh, the main principle that we should be fostering, developing in our economic systems, as opposed to planning government intervention and regulation, et cetera. And this, and this is a very wide spectrum. There's, it's not like you either believe in competition or against it. It's just kind of, you know, different ways to, to view it. So 
The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was intended to reintroduce competition in the workplace, not by not not originally by breaking companies breaking companies up, but rather regulating those companies so that they don't participate in anti-competitive practices. For example, now Teddy Roosevelt is is the one that kind of took this act and began using it in he took it another large step further. It wasn't just, hey, we're going to regulate these companies' um, uh, anti-competitive practices. It was, we're going to split these companies up. We, we the government, are going to forcibly like dictate that these companies like completely split because they've they've you know met the definition of what we consider a monopoly. First off, Teddy Roosevelt is one of the most fascinating individuals, I think, in history. He's done everything from like being a cattle rancher to a rough rider, charging the hill at San Juan under gunfire without orders. <laughs> um, he hired a professional boxer to spar with when he was in the White House and got partially blinded in an eye. I mean, he a lot of the <laughs> rules, like the forward pass and a lot of it, the rules that we use in the NFL are attributed to Teddy Roosevelt. He mm-hmm. loved the violence of the game, but he also didn't want people to keep dying because we had a lot of people die playing football. So, oh, wow. just fascinating. Yeah, and he gave a speech. He got shot in the chest and the bullet was lodged in his – still gave the speech. Doctors kept were up going. There, kept going. I think I, the doctors <laughs> were up there trying to get him to stop and looking at his wound and he just kept giving the speech. Just a fascinating, fascinating individual. But when it comes to Teddy Roosevelt – and. Like you said, he took this a step further to understand his motivations. He was not, um, he is not like a rags to riches story. He came from pretty, pretty well off. Um, but I think his experience on the cattle ranch, um, just doing all of these quote unquote man- manly things gave him an empathy for the working man in the middle class of America. And he had what was called the square deal. And those were really aimed at, um, well, aimed at uplifting the non-upper class, basically. So, um, and those three, you know, you break it into three C, three C's of the square deal. So, uh, four sides, three C's. Con- conservation of natural resources, control of corporations, and consumer protection. So, he, you know, two of those C's deal with what we're talking about now. Control of the corporations, which he felt were way too powerful, and they thought they were on equal terms or greater terms than the government. And he was like, no way. And then also con- consumer protection, but not just, hey, I want to get the best price possible, but okay, is my is this going to be, am I going to be forced off my own land because I can't make payments because the prices are too high? And suddenly now I'm, my even just the protection of what is a fundamental right, private property being taken away and eroded by these big businesses. Yeah, it's it's interesting where the phrase square deal comes from because Ted, in 1902, there was a big coal strike and long story short, Teddy Roosevelt like personally intervened and unlike the uh, Ledlow uh, coal miner strike that we had talked about a few episodes ago, the the federal government intervened on behalf of the workers and Roosevelt said, my action on labor should always be considered in connection with my action as regards capital. And both are reducible to my favorite formula, a square deal for every man. So we see it's interesting that Roosevelt, a Republican who's been traditionally big biz- or pro big business or just business in general, uh, was was really trying to cut the Gordian knot between workers and and uh, uh, business by saying, "Hey, we're going to do what's right by everybody." It's interesting about that story with that breaking up the you know negotiating on behalf of the workers and that strike. They did get better hours and better wages, but the way he did it, we it we might have heard the term the bully pulpit, and I think it had some different. It wasn't just bullying like he's going to go in and slap you around, but. It, he kind of did verbally, <laughs> but it was really yeah. like a grand, like a grand pulpit. Um, and that was kind of how it was used back then. But he used his bully pulpit to bully people. 
and the bully pulpit was the fact that he was the president and he sat in the White House and that was supposed to have a lot of weight behind it. The presidents from Grant all the way through McKinley were basically just suits. Um, they did a little bit here and there and I don't want to diminish the office of you know, the president of the United States and their achievements, but – by and large, they didn't really do anything to attack big business and they were just kind of there and things just sort of went. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was not going to do that. And in this strike, he demanded that they come to the White House to negotiate. He even had mm. Wall Street put pressure on some of the um, some of the uh, owners of the coal mine to put pressure on their homes. Like he was like, I'm gonna, he's like, no, put pressure on their mortgages. Like he, oh, and wow. he made it public. And he, that was the thing he did, um, he appealed directly to the American people and was like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing or I'm de- negotiating on behalf of you, the worker, the working man from the white house, from this grand piece, the place in American history, I'm arguing yeah. on your behalf. And I think that had a lot of, um, a lot of, actually it did have a lot of weight because he won reelection in the landslide, um, by capturing a lot of this populist labor movement that was traditionally not in favor of Republicans, but he won them. It's just, it's just very interesting. Yeah. Super interesting. <laughs> it all, it may, it kind of makes me wonder um, if this is, if, if it would be safe to say that Teddy Roosevelt was the first Republican president that really, that began shifting the party to being a party of the people in the early 1900s, something that really didn't culminate un- until uh, maybe Eisenhower, like 50 years later. But like the seeds had uh, had already started. It was almost like executives of each uh, of both parties kind of realized, like, oh shoot, if we appeal to the people, we can actually have a much larger chance or a much greater chance of winning. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And again, it's you know we talked about this in the history of the political parties with the Republican Party. They were definitely more pro business, but they were still in a way pro American because they put in tariffs which protected American industries and prevented foreign uh, cooperation. I I tend to think also that these oligarchs and corporate tycoons they gained so much wealth so quickly that it kind of just overwhelmed the the government, like it, it, it's not something that in their lifetime they ever experienced anything like this. A, they were getting money, so they're getting paid. I mean, that's corruption, but you know, they're somebody's paying you extra money. Oh, and it seems to have a net benefit. Eh, I'll just be quiet and look the other way, and we'll just business as usual. So, I, I don't want to make it seem like the Republican government didn't care, but I think that they were very apathetic. He was, I, Teddy Roosevelt was definitely a president who was empathetic with the majority of the American people. And you could see that. Yeah, I mean, who knows? A, who, a little empathy, a little sympathy can go a long way from the White House. But, it, you know, it's also interesting, too. You're talking about Teddy Roosevelt with this square deal was arguing for policies and real change for the American people before there was, um, and I'm paraphrasing some of the quotes, but you had these tycoons kind of going back and forth laughing about um, the political elections. And I can't remember which president it was, but they're basically like, the biggest issue is does Grover Cleveland have a, have a mistress and does he have a child with her? Like they weren't arguing over policy. People didn't, it was like Democrats and the Republicans and the Democrats were basically the same thing. They weren't arguing substantial policy, so to speak. It was, yeah, and it's ironic too because the political participation during the Gilded Age was like eighty something percent. It was unheard of. It was twice as high as it is now. But even then, people were voting a lot of kind of issues, and they couldn't really tell the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Um, so you could argue that they were both capitalists, and they were both the same thing because they were arguing over, "Hey, does this guy have a mistress or not?" So. But Teddy Roosevelt was like, no, here's the square deal that I'm going to give you and I'm going to work toward and I'm going to leverage the Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890 to go after what I deem as a problem and it's this big business. And there's good trust and there's bad trust. And the good trusts are the ones that are not going to the, – the net benefit 
is not there. They're they're not pri- or they're not price fixing. They're not doing this. They're just successful because they're good. It's not the size of the company. Um, big does not necessarily mean bad. It's the way that they've gained that wealth and they've gained that power. But then there's these bad trusts who have done like Standard Oil and some of these. Um, he comes after Andrew Carnegie as well with Steel and a few others. They they've used unscrupulous means, and I'm going to come after them and I'm going to break them up. Yeah, it's probably worth mentioning that Teddy Roosevelt during his presidency was it 43 or 44 antitrust lawsuits against companies 43 uh and like his his like relative uh contemporaries presidents um only had like 16 or 19 or something like that combined. So it was like Teddy Roosevelt really used the Sherman Anti Trust Act. Like it wasn't like he just kind of went after certain companies. Like he was pro government regulation. <laughs> right. Uh, and his justification was not it. It's, it's interesting to take a look at. And this is probably going to piss off the libertarians because. It, <laughs> The government intervention that Teddy Roosevelt, he was doing it in the interest of the American people and saying like, hey, hey, this is not fair. Like you can't – like nobody is able to – just because the government is intervening does not mean your rights are being taken away. As a matter of fact, we're doing what we should to try and protect them because if you think that you can stand in the way of Standard Oil and the amount of wealth that they have – I've got news for you. You can't. You never will. And it's not right. necessarily that they have a better product. They did in a lot of cases and they were very innovative. And we talk about John Rockefeller and his innovation and a lot of good that they did. But he will destroy you and um, a lot of people are going to get hurt along the way. And your ability to gain private property and hold on to your private property and a lot of your rights are going to be stripped away. That's not fair. So sometimes a little government intervention is good because tyranny can come in different forms. It can come in the form of an ol- oligarchy that has a tremendous amount of wealth and sway that might be more powerful than the government. Does that right. sound familiar today? Yeah. And that's why I think it's important to talk about, you know, history rhyming. We look back at this and we say, wow, there's a lot of these big companies. Why? Because we have to understand why is a big business bad? Is it because it's very large and wealthy or is it because they are infringing upon the American citizens right to private property and their ability to gain private property and hold private property? I uh, no. This is a this is a great transition to kind of like how some of this stuff is significant for today. Thinking about Teddy Roosevelt's square deal for every man, so we far too often in today's political discourse, uh, you know, kind of bringing it back to this is a this is a history of capitalism and socialism. We in today's political discourse, we unfairly. Uh, stereotype ideas and then just demonize the other side in order for people to kind of buy off on our own things now. And, and what I mean by that is the, like the coal miner strike in 1902 that Teddy Roosevelt intervened in and got this phrase, the square deal for every man. Uh, And we talked about this a little bit in our last episode, but like these people were not full blown Marxists. I'm sure there some of them were, right? I'm sure, you know, the the anarchists and socialists were on the same side of these individuals. But as we discussed in our last episode, they probably hadn't read Marx. <laughs> they probably like weren't over there talking about workers of the world unite. They're probably uh, you know, going, hey man, like three of my friends have died this year in the mine because there's no protection against us. Uh, or sorry, there's no protection for us uh, in this stuff. I'm barely getting paid. My my wife and seven kids are hanging out back at the house. Like I could barely feed. Like, <laughs> can I please get a raise? <laughs> can I get a raise and not make a deal with the devil every time I'm going into the coal mine? <laughs> and it's just right now. One can have their opinions on labor u- labor unions, right? The like we talked, I. I 100% believe that labor unions are the gateway drug to socialism, and I am not a socialist by any stretch of the imagination. However, we sh- we have to understand where the other side is coming from, and I, I think Teddy Roosevelt 
did. I think Teddy Roosevelt was like, look, both sides, like we want, we want big business. And as again, as we talked about in our last episode, we, the American people should want people to be getting filthy rich because that has a, uh, you know, how, how does the phrase go? A rising tide elevates all boats, right? Like it's when like Elon Musk and dare I say, Mark Zuckerberg have created a butt ton of wealth for this country that has benefited all of us and and say what you will about, you know, Facebook, the, there's certain bad aspects about big business, but there's also a lot of good aspects about it, regardless of what your political persuasion is. So the right way forward, the things that we should be learning about these, these history lessons is what does right look like and what what is the square deal for everyone? <laughs> yeah, because that square deal, I mean, it's it's probably it's changed a little bit now, but you know, fundamentally it really hasn't. You know, the monopolies and what they're monopolizing has changed. You know, if you look at the food industry now, it's like, well, all my food comes from basically four distributors or you know, oh that yeah. hey, there's only six companies that control all the food that I go and get at a supermarket. I don't know if I like that. That's, that's not really competitive. Can I start a, can I start my own, you know, supply chain for food? No, you can't. There's no way. So that, that's the thing. It's like, well, just go, you know, go build your own. Well, okay. I can't just go. I want wanting to have a decent selection of food that is not poison because only six companies own it. That's not good for anybody. You don't a, a monopoly de-incentivizes them to creating a good product. They will make a good product, create a monopoly, and then that's it. Having a continuous continuous competition that allows more and more ideas and products into it is better because it A, keeps the cost down for you, and B, it makes sure that you have the ability to choose the best possible product. Again, like I was saying, if you only have six companies, I don't care what brand of food you buy, that brand is probably owned by one of six different companies. Hey, yeah. I, I hate to break it to you. Like you're not, you don't really have a choice. Like you can't just not buy it. Hey, I can't just grow my own, grow my own food all the time. I've got to work. I don't have time to have a farm or I don't have the ability to grow, you know, the land to sustain my family. So this is the only option I have. I'd like to have more options. Saying that is not a bad thing. And having the government come in and say, Hey, you know what? You're right. We need to protect your ability to make choices. Um, that's not like tyrannical government either. So, right. you know, I don't know. That's my little, my little spiel on it, but no, it, I, I think it. it's important for us to understand that now because that's where, that's where I think this conversation is heading. It's not necessarily the size of the company because we have companies that are worth trillions of dollars now. It's what they're monopolizing it and the effect it has on your ability to choose. And your ability to choose, you know, your ability to choose these products and your ability, you know, to maintain this this dream of private property this that because that again it goes back to that it's the foundation for all rights that's what separates capitalists from marxists so if you want to own private property you need to be able to protect it you need to understand what kind of political and economic fight you're going to be in because it takes different forms but it all goes back to this right right no good good stuff so with all that being said Let's let's close the let's end the chapter on trust busting and Teddy Roosevelt and Standard Oil. So again, Ida Tarbell's Standard Oil History of the Standard Oil Company, fascinating read, highly recommend. That created a, a, an uproar that Teddy Roosevelt was able to channel because we already know that he is a a man of the people and he channeled that anger and then went and began suing all of these different. Um, trust to break them up 43 to be exact um, within the department and the department of justice went through and investigated. And the big one that we talk about is the standard oil company. The standard oil company uh, was sued in 1909. And then before the Supreme court in 1911, there were arguments made. And in 1911, the Supreme court decided that um, the standard oil company was in fact in violation and that split them up. And just to show you how big this company was, um, like Amoco, uh, I think Texaco, pretty much in Marathon. You know, if you go to a gas station, chances are that company 
was oh, I think Shell and BP are the only ones that not, but actually they bought um, subsidiaries that were Standard Oil, and that's how they kind of came into the U.S. Like uh, Sohio um, Gas, I think that was kind of a Midwest gas chain. BP actually bought them out, and that's how they entered and gained a foothold in the market. That's Is, how didn't big they Chevron. Were. Chevron also yeah. used to be part of Standard Oil. <laughs> yeah, I mean exactly. You name it. If you go to a gas station, chances are either it was wholly part of standard oil or it was bought by a comp you know part of the company you're shopping at bought uh, whatever subsidiary of standard oil that's how massive this company was and they came through and they started breaking these up 43 to be exact um, and i think this really signaled the end of the gilded age and ushered in this age of progressive this progressive policies with uh, woodrow wilson and um, later we'll see Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his four terms were, I, that's going to be a huge topic because again, that's the new deal. That's every socialist loves to go back and, and talk about the new deal. So we absolutely are. Well, in, in the great depression, right? Like all these, all these capitalist policies like come into serious question in 1929 when, when the earth, when the earth caves in. Yeah. And you know, uh, we'll, there was, we'll talk about that in the future. There were signs that that was going to be happening. You know, the first, they, I think it was the panic or depression of 1893 that occurred. A lot of that happened because there was basically just total unregulation of banks and big business and money was being floated around and then they would get mad at each other and they would try and tank each other's stock and buy it for pennies on the dollar. And everybody else was left with nothing. So yeah, the, the signs were there that this was going to be coming for years and we just kind of ignored it. Everybody was getting, a lot of people were getting rich. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about in a future episode, how the, how the great depression kind of changed the conversation between capitalists and socialists, but that's, that's in the future. Uh, Colin, thanks again for another super informative episode on uh, here on the loins of history. Uh, if you uh, liked what we're doing here, please give us a five star review that helps uh, a lot to get the to get the word out. That helps the Spotify and Apple algorithms to know that we're here because there's a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, so if you like that, please go and uh, give us a five star review. Leave us a comment. Uh, you can even email us at the at loinsofhistory at gmail.com. Super uh, open to getting feedback there. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, all some some variation of loins of history. So if you just go onto that website and put it in, in the search bar, you, there's also a link to, to our uh, pages there in the show notes. Uh, you can also, uh, if you really like what we're doing here, you can support us on Patreon as well and get some access to exclusive content. Uh, so that does it for this episode of the Lords of History. Thank you so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you next week.